The biggest danger we face today, it's the deficit. You know the sign that Tom Carville had up? Um, I think that's his name. He said, it's the economy, stupid. And sure enough, they pounded that message. Well, it's the deficit, stupid. There's no question that today, the most critical issue we face, whether you're talking politics, whether you're talking economics, whether you're talking your personal pocketbook, is how we manage government, how we spend your money. Why did I name the watchdog group Truth in Government? I could have picked some fancy acronym, but it dawned on me that really this is a consumer issue. Let's face it, government imposes on you truth in lending and truth in advertising. Don't you think it's time that you imposed on them truth in government spending? Tell us what you're spending, all right? It's simple, you're a consumer. When you pay taxes, guess what? You are buying goods and services. You're buying government services at all levels with your taxes, and government spends a lot on equipment, so indirectly, those are goods you're buying. The federal government alone spends $200 billion a year on equipment, furniture, assets, and guess what? We have no capital budget. Can you imagine an entity that spends $200 billion a year? That's out of a trillion, 500 billion. I'll get into the numbers here. And we don't have a capital budget. So how are we going to respect the usefulness of assets. How are we gonna get bureaucrats to understand that when we buy an asset, you gotta manage it, you gotta maintain it, you gotta protect it, not just think about disposing of it at a fire sale so you can reduce the deficit, but that's what their mentality is. I was there. I was on the Government Operations Committee. I saw them trying to sell assets, some of them even knew because of the accounting system. Our accounting system says anytime you get cash, it reduces the deficit. They don't put it into surplus. They don't reduce the national debt with it. This is the biggest shell game in the world, and it's being played in Washington. Now, do I have your interest? Are you ready? Are you ready for me to take you on a journey that will depress you in the beginning? Because I'm going to give you all the bad news. But I'll end up with some good news, because this is America. And there's always hope, I think, when you're in America. Well, you've heard about my background. It's very simple. Uh, you might say that I am the promise of America, as you are and your families are. Both my parents are immigrants. America is a great place. You can come here with nothing, even today. Look at the Koreans and their families owning the grocery stores and the vegetable stands. That was what my father did when he came from Italy in 1929. Couldn't get a job, had a fourth grade education. But somehow, America gave him enough so that he was able to raise three children, and I'm the oldest of three. And he saw the need for education as the real link to democracy and success, and worked very hard with my mom in that grocery store in the South Bronx, and we had to be there too. And my family, there was no such thing as, look what I'm gonna do for you, we're gonna work together. Whatever I did, he matched. And that's what's wrong with our society today. We're doing too much for too many people, not expecting things in return. And the word welfare has been now, as you know, become a code word for dependency. And we've created a whole new federal plantation I mean, the new plantation is the federal plantation. How are we going to deal with it? Because we're not empowering people. We're not making them our partners. We're making them our wards. And this is the problem we have with society. But that's for the 1994 debate when I run for election again. Let's keep to this one. So I worked my way through college as a waiter. I was proud to do it. Because my father said, you do that, and I'll do this for you. And then when I was just about to go to law school, I had passed the law boards. I did very well. In school, I worked hard. That was, you know, when you're hungry, you want, you want things, you work hard for it. And um, Arthur Anderson came on the campus. He said, you know, we have an internship program, and you're doing so well in accounting. And I only took accounting because somebody told me that it was the accountants and the law firms that got the highest bonuses. So I figured, well, this is where I got to go. So I took a major in accounting, never thinking I'd end up in an accounting firm. But that's what happened. I was picked as an intern in Arthur Anderson, 1961. And it was love at first sight. I never went back to law school. I thought I might. I then switched to the tax department a few years later and became a partner in 1972, just 10 years after joining the firm, and left after 22 years at the age of 43 to do something that people thought was crazy, and that was to run for Congress when I had never run for anything in my life. One thing, I was elected president of my homeowners association in uh, the New Rochelle area. So um, I'm, I'm delighted that what I proved is that if you're a possibility thinker, you can continue what my parents did, what your parents did, 
If you work hard at it, if you have a vision, and if you're clear about what you want, you can convince people and do something crazy, like run for Congress, never having been elected. I had to fight off seven Republicans, three conservatives, just to win the nominations, and then wait for the winner of a four-way Democratic primary, and here we go, I get in. Only to meet, guess whom, two years later? The woman with the hat, Bella Rabza. She came up to challenge me. That was my race in 1986. Now, I don't know whether you're conservatives or liberals, but the conservatives are going to love me because I retired Bella Rabza. That was my claim to fame. I have an asterisk, asterisk in the political book of records. He retired her in 86. And that's with Warren Beatty sitting in the front row, one debate, Shirley MacLaine, another. I one time turned to her, I said, Bella, are we running in West Hollywood or West Chester? What are all these people doing up here? In any case, I left Congress uh, in, in my district. You might say, well, how did I leave? Uh, I inherited a district carved by a very liberal Democrat. His name was Richard Ottinger. Uh, and that district was carved after the 80 census. They never thought a Republican who was characterized as a fiscal conservative like me could make it. But with a little help from Ronald Reagan in 1984, I squeaked in by 2,000 votes. I was another close race with Bella Rabzug, only to succumb to another person that I called Bella without the hat, losing by 2,000 votes in 88. And I again decided to run, and you could see what happened. George Bush ran a very, shall I use the word? lousy race. I mean, <laughs> and we should have done a lot better than we did. So we'll just have to wait until we get back. But let me tell you this. <clears throat> I get to Congress in 1985. And what is the thing that shocked me as soon as I got there? I was told that I was the first certified public accountant practicing CPA, because there were a couple of attorneys who passed the CPA exams, in the history of America, House or Senate, ever to be elected. Now, is that incredible? I mean, you talk about 60% of the votes being cast today are votes that have to do with numbers. The budget process, which is an annual process, I'd like to see it go every two years so we can do some qualitative budgeting, not this nonsense quantitative, you know, what did we give you last year, and let's give you another 5%. But think about it, one CPA. But guess what else I counted that year? And it's still there. I left them. 276 lawyers, all right? now. That's out of 535 legislators, 100 in the Senate, 435 in the House. So now, there are no accountants in Congress and at least 276 attorneys. Can you imagine 276 lawyers without an accountant? <laughs> this is what you got. This is what you got. Everybody's spending and nobody's counting. And if they try to count, they don't have the systems. They don't have the accounting principles. They don't have the processes. Read the book, and I hope You've got each three on the table. I don't know that there's enough to go around to everybody, but we have more. And if you're interested in that book on the way out, if you want, I didn't want to be presumptuous, I will sign it to you, and it's yours to keep. We have some more. And by the way, if you give me your card, that's all you have to do, I will put you on the mailing list of Truth in Government so that you get my publications and you see what I'm doing around America to create a firestorm at the grassroots the way Howard Jarvis did back, what, 15 years ago on his American tax revolt mo movement and Proposition 13. It's absolutely needed. So going back to CPAs, there's another thing that I found out. CPAs are held in very high esteem. But guess what's held in very low esteem? Congressmen. And that was proven in a poll in 1987 on the 100th anniversary of the accounting profession when Lou Harris, I think, took the poll. They ranked 12 professions. Guess what ranked number one dead heat with physicians, CPAs? Number 12, congressmen, including senators. So you might say I traded off the profession with the highest esteem for the one with the lowest. Not easy to do, but that's what happened. Let's talk about the real issue. It is the deficit. Why is it the deficit? Let's talk about some numbers, just so you get a perspective of where we are. But let me give you the numbers that they are giving you. And mind you, the numbers that I'm going to give you would land a corporate official in jail under the SEC rules if these numbers represented the financial condition or the operating results of their entities. They are prepared on a basis that is so spurious, uh, based on the most Mickey Mouse accounting system the world has ever seen. It's called the cash basis of accounting. It's what you use in your house when you prepare your checkbook. You decide an expense is an expense when you decide to write the check, not when you bill. Well, we took New York City off of that system in 1975 as a price for the bailout, but we still use it. Why? Politicians love it. 
is designed by and for politicians because they can make the bottom line be anything they want it to be under the cash basis. They can accelerate revenue. They can defer expenses. You saw them do it on the ground, Rudman. You remember the military payroll one week? How they got 53 weeks in one year just to meet that artificial target? Well, this is going on every day. That's why I had to write the book. The book is not a kiss and tell book like Mr. Stockman wrote. His was a good book, there's no question. But I didn't name names. I indicted both parties. I indicted the process. I went after the, 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 the bogus principles, systems, procedures, and everything else, the gimmicks and the budget process, so that you could understand that no matter what you're getting out of Washington, you shouldn't believe it until we, the people, impose on Washington what they impose on us. And it's simple. The right accounting system exists. Everything exists. You know where they are? The Securities and Exchange Commission. Those are rules that are made by Congress. You couldn't issue one share of stock as a publicly traded corporation or a bond unless you had your 10K, unless you had certified statements, unless you had disclosure this thick. Otherwise, you could be subject to securities fraud. And yet, guess who is the largest issuer of securities in the world? The United States of America. I understand we issue $30 billion on average of bonds, treasury bills, notes every month. Not only the new deficit, but we have to roll over. Our, our deficit, our debt, is only on an average five years. It's not bonded long term, okay? And by the way, that's significant politically because if Clinton dares to do what Carter did when he came back and fulfill his promise to raise taxes, and not just on the rich, because we know that to collect $150 billion the way he wants to, you got to go down to people that are earning $36,000. You watch what happens to interest rates. And where is the interest on the national debt going to be then? Now, let me give you some numbers. Are you ready for the numbers? Some big numbers. Uh, we spent, let me use the numbers for the last fiscal year, September 30th, 1992. It just ended. We spent <clears throat> approximately one trillion. $500 billion. That was our annual budget. Our gross domestic product right now, I think, is approaching $6 trillion, somewhere between, depending on how you count it. Okay, let me give you the big numbers here, the macro picture. So you got a trillion five being directed by the government out of our gross uh, domestic product. But it's really more when you consider regulation and everything else. Let's not get into that. There's a wonderful book written about that by uh, Hal Stein that you ought to uh, Harold Stein that you ought to read. I, in fact, I did the book review for the Wall Street Journal uh, about two years ago on that book. But let's come up with some other numbers. What was the deficit at the end of this fiscal year? Approximately 400 billion, that's with a B, dollars. What was the interest we paid during the last fiscal year? 212 billion, with a B, dollars. Now, think about these numbers. Number one, you know that we're spending more than we should so that a trillion five today is probably, and we'll get the charts like Perot had before I do this on TV one day, uh, to show you exactly, but I'm sure it's doubled just within the last seven years. I remember when I came in with, uh, in 1985, it was about half that. So there's no question, even using this bogus accounting system, we are spending like drunken sailors, and, and, and drunken sailors, we gotta change this. Uh, but let's look at the deficit. We were supposed to be at zero in 1990, under something called Graham Rudman. You remember Graham Rudman? It was a nice plan. Nobody thought Graham Rudman was the answer, but Republicans and Democrats realized back in 1985 that there was no discipline in Congress. And if we didn't do something to impose discipline, a sort of Damocles on the legislative branch of government, that spending would get out of hand. Well, they took the medicine, and it went for two years, and they realized, hey, we're never gonna hit these targets. And that's after playing games like they did with the military payroll, but much more than that was done. So they then deferred the date to get down to zero to 1993. So three more years they added to it. Well, by the time they got to 1990, they realized this is a fool's quest. And they very quietly, as part of the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, and they didn't tell you about this, they didn't advertise it, they superseded Graham Rudman with the Budget Enforcement Act, which did some nice things. For instance, it built a firewall around the Social Security Trust Funds. I'll get to that in a minute. But 
It killed Graham Rudman, and they didn't tell you about it. There are people today still come to me thinking that Graham Rudman is in effect. It's RIP, rest in peace. So now we're at 400 billion and climbing, okay? Now, if you think that's the bad news, I shouldn't say it's the good news, but the really bad news is that that's the number after putting off the books huge expenses or expenditures like the bailout of the savings and loan industry. Back in 1989, in order not to tell you how expensive that bailout was, they created an off-budget agency called RTC, the Resolution Trust Corporation. Well, there was an on-budget agency, but it was insolvent. It was called FISLIC, right? The Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation. Well, what they did is they borrowed $50 billion. That was the first installment of the bailout. But they borrowed it off the books. Now, can you imagine doing something off the books in your corporation? But they did that, off the budget. It really means off the books. They put it in RTC. It stayed there momentarily. It was then lent to an on-budget agency, FISLIC. The moment it was lent, guess what happened? It reduced the deficit by $50 billion because of the cash coming in. Now, Karen Digmill, and you'll see this on page, I believe it is 18 of my book, said in 1989 in Insight Magazine, this is like a husband, could be the spouse, let's say this time a husband, going to the bank, borrowing $100, coming home and giving his wife $50 to pay a bill, thinking they've saved the other $50, not realizing they had to borrow $100 to begin with. This is the way the federal government is keeping your books. Because on a cash basis, we don't recognize any liabilities. All we do is recognize the flow of cash, which is something that we have to know, because the Treasury Department needs to know when the cash is required. That's why it sells bonds. But that shouldn't be the basis upon which we account for the operating results of this huge entity called the United States of America. But that's what is happening today, <laughs> and that is wrong. Now, let me just tell you about some of these things that they won't tell you about. The national debt, they say, is $4 trillion. Would you be shocked if I told you that the national debt is over $10 trillion? It is, and no one's been able to argue with me. The real national debt is $10 trillion. We've only bonded $4 trillion. Because of the need for cash now, and the fact that we keep so many things off the books, forget about funding. The only thing we ever tried to fund was the Social Security. And you know what they did with that in 1974, with a flip of a pencil called the Unified Budget? They took a trillion dollars out of the Social Security trust funds, and they just put them in the general fund. So in effect, you took Social Security taxes, the most regressive tax in the world, nobody can get out of it. It's taxed on the first dollar, no exemptions, no deductions hurts the poor more than the rich, and they funded a good piece of the government in the 1980s on Social Security taxes that were raised as FICA taxes. The politicians said, this is a trust fund. They said, this is our sacred obligation, but they quickly just put an IOU in there, a Treasury bill, took the cash, and reduced the deficit. And that was what we tried to fund. Now, forget about funding. That doesn't exist in government. We're out of money, as you know. We're out of cash. We live from hand to mouth. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and unfortunately, we're becoming too dependent on some outside capital we shouldn't be. So what you have are liabilities that if you were a publicly traded corporation, the accounting principles exist to record this. This is not magic. Let me start with some. How about Social Security? How about the obligation for the people that are alive today and working, what is it on an actuarially sound basis, not to fund, but to record, which every corporation must do for its pensions. What number do you have to put on the balance sheet of that entity just to cover the people that are alive and working today for what they've earned under the current benefit system? Well, that number is at a minimum $4 trillion. And depending upon what assumptions you use for interest, longevity, retirement, and things like that, not retirement because that doesn't qualify, with Social Security, you're talking four to six trillion. But let's take five trillion. And by the way, this is not Joe DiAguardi speaking. My firm, Arthur Anderson, back in 75, after Proxmire hired it 
to be the consultant to monitor the affairs of New York City to report to the Senate Banking Committee. And you see the mess the books were in New York City in those days. They decided to try to do the same thing for the United States of America and prepared a prototype called the Consolidated Financial Statements of the United States of America. And they put the books on the right basis, the approval basis. Now, you can imagine this report when it came out. It had two pages of statements and 28 pages of footnotes. I mean, it had to be because of the trouble of valuing this and that. But in that, they valued the Social Security, and this is what they would have come to today. And that report is prepared today, but government doesn't advertise it. It is signed by the Controller General, and it's signed by the Secretary of the Treasury, but you have to ask for it. Anderson doesn't do it anymore. It's done by the federal government. But in any case, how about $5 trillion? Now, what about the pensions for military? Another trillion. What about civil service? Okay? Now, let's get to some real big numbers that may take it well above $10 trillion, but we're not sure. Guess what's become the new game in town now that we've run out of cash and now that we understand the political pain of raising taxes, which Clinton will find out pretty soon? It's called guarantee. Guarantee, guarantee. The full faith and credit of the United States of America can do anything for you. Just put it on a guarantee and you'll raise the money. Well, guess what? Savings and loans, those were guarantees, weren't they? Well, I found, and you'll read it in the book, 12 major loan programs. What about Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae? What about all these government-sponsored enterprises? What about all the loan programs that we've guaranteed? Student loans, hey, you're talking trillions. Not one dollar is recorded on the books of the United States of America for any default probability. Now, that was the past. <clears throat> and by the way, I should say this, another advantage of the Budget Enforcement Act was that now you have to score. For instance, when we guaranteed the bonds for Israel, all right, that 10 billion, the, uh, the scoring was $400 million. And there was a fight as to whether that money could be taken out of the foreign aid budget. I wouldn't get into it. So now there is another thing that happened. Not only is there a wall around Social Security so that the current surpluses cannot be removed, are they going to put back the trillion? No, it's like the notch babies. How, how can you find this kind of money? It's not there. So they're going to just start from now and build a wall so that the surpluses build up. The same thing now, a good thing happened with the scoring. But any law Congress passes today, it could change tomorrow. And you know that, because the currency of Congress is legislation. We know that. Graham Rudman was changed. The budget process has changed, on average, I think, every four to five years. We're never dealing with the same deck. And that's the problem we have. So I just gave you some of the numbers. I just told you that the real problem is not what you see. It's what you don't see. And yet the political agenda is set. And races are run by what you see. Why wasn't my book reviewed by the New York Times or the Washington Post? It got enough reviews. It got me on 96 radio call-in shows in the last six months and seven major cable TV shows, including McLaughlin. But the Times wouldn't touch it. None of the liberal press would touch it because they know that this would be the end of liberalism. It would be the end of the ability to fuel the liberal machine, which is money, spending, to get reelected. And that's basically what they're doing. I saw it. I was on the inside. Once the public finds out about the real cost of government, you don't have to worry about the political process. It's going to change because the public will have very little tolerance for this kind of spending. The trouble is they don't know about it. What's worse, the press, most of them don't know about it because they're not trained. They're not trained in finances, most of the press. So it's difficult for them to write about this issue. They tend to shy away from it. So as a result, the information doesn't get to the public as well.